final speaker in today's session is Professor Neil Rosen. Professor Rosen is the Professor of Pharmacology, Cell Biology, and Medicine at Cornell University, my old alma mater. He's a member of the Department of Medicine and the Molecular Pharmacology and Chemistry Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he's also the head of developmental therapeutics. Most importantly, though, has been a recent human genetics experiment that uh, Professor Rosen has participated in. He has now uh, generated his F2 progeny. As of a week ago, he became a grandfather. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. No back crosses. This is one case where my uh, lack of knowing any genetics is helpful. Uh, let's see, where are we going to uh, start here? How do we do this? I'd like to thank Michael. I'd like to comment to John Blennis that there's no such thing as too much money, John. There may be such a thing as too much uh, metabolites, but not too much money. So we're in the middle of the talk here. Thank you. Uh, it won't be any surprise to my friends that I'm going to talk about feedback today. Uh, this is the, you can consider this the clinician talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about alkaprotein activated feedback, which turns out to be a very simple concept that has complicated details that I think is important both for the biology of transformation and for therapy, and is part of the reason uh, that mTOR inhibitors and lots of other oncoprotein pathway inhibitors don't work as well as we would hope. Uh, so this is a, <coughs> excuse me, this is a 1986 or seven unbelievably oversimplified view of EGFR or any membrane uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. You activate it, it autophosphorylates and transphosphorylates stuff. You activate pathways. The only pathways I actually know about are RAS and PI3K, so those are the ones on the slide. This is 1988. It's two years later, uh, or just some arbitrary amount of time, but a long time ago, we've known, as we've known, MIT is a good place to discuss this because Norbert Wiener was the pioneer of systems control and feedback. Uh, as with anything else in the cell or any engineered system, the duration of signaling, the amplitude of signaling in a network is controlled by lots of positive and negative feedback loops. And this is true for mitogenic signaling as well. So I'll just focus. Today I'm not going to talk about PI3K because John talked about it. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about RAS. So I'll tell you, you activate EGFR. And this I'm going to tell you about 2% of the feedbacks. And most of this was known by 1990. You activate RAS and RAF. You activate ERK, and just the ERK, just ERK, will phosphorylate the receptor and other receptors, phosphorylate and inhibit SOS and other exchange factors. Uh, you will phosphorylate CRAF, as shown by the beautiful work of Debbie Morrison, and turn it off. And you will induce the transcription and expression of lots of proteins that function to induce feedback, including multiple members of the MAP kinase phosphatase family, including DUSP6, which dephosphorylates ERK, and multiple members of the Sprouty family, which mostly I don't understand, but which act to feedback inhibit RAF and transduction of the FGFR and EGFR signals to RAS. And I'm, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with the EGF to RAS feedback, although not the whole thing. So the question becomes, first of all, if you have an activated oncoprotein in a signaling pathway, RAS, PI, 3K, mTOR, whatever, uh, if you have constitutive activation, or at least hyperactivation, shouldn't you get hyperactivation of feedback? And you do, and this has been, since first pointed out uh, by us and others over the last 10 years, this is true for just about every oncoprotein you can think of. I'll show the first piece of data on this from uh, Philip Cohn's student and colleague, uh, Dario Alessi. The first time anybody got a hold of a very selective MEK inhibitor, uh, Dario found, this is our data, but Dario, this is probably 12 years after Dario did it. When you inhibit MEK, you relieve ERK feedback, Phosphomec is actually, you inhibit MEC, uh, ERK very well. When you inhibit ERK, you reactivate Phosphomec. Mostly, the, repetitive, the rapid response here is mostly due to dephosphorylation of inhibitory, of inhibit, uh, a loss of inhibitory phosphorylations of CRAF. 
And this turns out to be very important. So I will give you three quick hypotheses and then give the talk based on this. And then the rest of the talk will be looking at RAF particularly, looking at RAF in human cancer. RAF is an oncogene and, and our ability to therapeutically inhibit RAF through the prism of feedback. And I think it's illuminating when one does it, you can, be, uh, you can decide. So hypothesis number one is, or question number one is how do you get output? This is gonna be important for the first part of the talk. What I, hypothesize, what I speculate is that activation of pathway output in the setting of this feedback must require selection of oncoproteins that are insensitive or less sensitive or have different sensitivity to the feedback, and that's what creates the output. Uh, and this is an, another, way, uh, another property. You can argue whether this is trivial or not, but it's another property that one can think about with oncoproteins when one thinks about the biochemistry of their activation. The other possibility, and Tyler, I think, has done some very interesting stuff here with Sprouty, is a second hit that attenuates the feedback and acts to induce the output. The second hypothesis, which I won't talk about, but is, I think, worth mentioning, is that sustained negative feedback occurs throughout the rest of the network. It's the oncoprotein that has decreased sensitivity. You have increased output, and you have activity, you have feedback throughout the rest of the network. This is certainly true. And the question is, does that cause a decrease in the robustness of the system and a hyperdependence, which is vulgarly called oncogene addiction, as first uh, shown by, uh, by uh, Dr. Weinstein from Columbia, I, th I believe this is in large part uh, the basis for oncogene addiction, but we can argue about that over coffee. The final thing, which is the most obvious that's been shown in the last several years, is that if this is so, the onco inhibiting the oncoprotein causes tumor cells to get sick and some of them to die, and as, the, as that's happening, you will relieve the negative feedback, you will restore network complexity, relieve oncogene addiction or dependence, if you will, and allow survival. And lately, Jeff Engelman and I are sick of calling this a feedback, so we call it adaptive resistance. It's one part of adaptive resistance, not the whole part. And this is just an example, uh, just to show you to you for polemic reasons more than any other. One of the things John knows but did not say is one of the major downstream consequences of activating PI3K AKT mTOR is profound feedback of, this, of inhibition of the expression and signaling of the receptors, most of which that are responsible for the physiologic activation of the pathway. So this is just a very simple Western blot done in one of those xenografts Bill was talking about. This is a function of concentration four hours after giving an mTOR kinase inhibitor. And I'm just basically showing you this for picturesque reasons to show you that this is not trivial. This is induction of phospho-UGFR, phospho-HER2, phospho-HER3, and phospho-IGF1R. The induction is profound. You activate multiple other pathways, and it attenuates the therapeutic response. And sometimes it makes patients worse. So here's an example, you know, a conundrum or a, a puzzle. Why are rapologs not effective, distinctly ineffective, in prostate cancer, in which PI3 kinase is activated all the time, mostly due to P10 loss. And you can rarely get a patient through one cycle of therapy. And the answer is, you activate the PI3K, you downregulate RTKs, those RTKs downregulate AR, androgen receptor, sorry. When you give rap, and this is published by Charles Sawyers in a collaboration between Charles and myself, when you inhibit a, a rapa, a mTOR, in this case with rapamycin in a patient, in about 40% of patients you get a frank and enormous induction of PSA because you're activating androgen receptor. And these patients indeed get worse, and they get better when you stop the rapalog. We can rarely do this with other tumors. This occurs in other tumors, notably pancreas, anecdotally from MD Anderson, but uh, from Jim Abrazizi. Uh, it's easiest to show with prostate because you have this marker. But uh, in the other cases, in lung and pancreas, they're anecdotal. But 
targeted inhibitors, because they relieve feedback and probably for other reasons, can actually cause tumors to grow faster. And I'll skip the PI3K. So that is basically the ideology. I'd like to talk about this in more detail in the context of activation of the ERK pathway. So this is just a boilerplate slide everyone knows. ERK is activated in lots of human tumors. The main purported mechanisms are via activation of RTKs and via three kinds, four kinds of mutation, NRAS or KRAS mutation predominantly, NF1 loss, uh, and BRAF mutation. So a long time ago, and many of you have seen this slide, and this is a collaboration with Bill and Levi Garraway, uh, we David Salat took lots of cell lines and divided them up by mechanism of activation and gave the allosteric mech inhibitors developed by Park Davis, that, by Judy Leopold and Alan Saltiel. The RAF tumors in cell culture were very, very sensitive. RAS tumors, a large cohort of RAS tumors in cell culture are sensitive. Those that are not sensitive often are insensitive because they have co-mutation in PI3K signal, in some uh, component of PI3K pathway. The thing was that the Arctic, in this case, HER2 amplified breast and mutant EGFR lung, tumors in which phosphoerc is very high, tumors in which the receptor is very high, were completely insensitive, or at best marginally sensitive. And the reason for this is the receptor is upstream of all the feedback, and if you look downstream at output, rather than phospho-EGFR, which is a singularly bad marker of output of this pathway, because the output includes MAP kinase phosphatase, which is both, the output is actually dephosphorylating phosphoerc. Output is marginally elevated, if at all, in these tumors, because the feedback is not abrogated by this muta these mutations, and at least in the case of HER2, what it's working through is PI3K, even though the drug is inhibiting ERK very well. So the question becomes, how how do you act actually activate ERK output in human tumors? So the answer is fairly simple. Well, I'll just give you the problem. When you activate ERK, you're going to downregulate RTK to wild-type RAS. This is just shown in a cell with, it's a HER2 cell, a cell with wild-type RAS and RAF, high RAS TTP, you do dox-inducible mech mutation or dox-inducible v e RAF, you down-regulate RAS GTP. So the question is, how do you transform with the RAS, with the RAF, given that you have down-regulated RAS GTP? With RAS, it's obvious. You are putting, and it turns out to be the case with NF1 as well, you down-regulate wild-type RAS, when you activate mutant RAS, but the mutant RAS, by virtue of its mechanism of activation, is not particular, it's mostly insensitive to upstream uh, stimuli, and RAS GTP remains high despite the feedback inhibition of signaling. So to activate RAF physiologically, among, not exclusive, but among the major events required is you activate RAS, RAS induces RAF dimerization. RAF dimerization is required for activation of RAF kinase. If you then activate ERK, you ought to downregulate RAS, as I just showed you. How does a RAF mutant transform? How do you get increased output? And the answer is very simple when seen in this way. It turns out you activate RAF in one of two ways. RAF is activated by many different mutations and many different translocations. And what we find now, and I'll show you the data in a minute, is that except for one RAF mutation that we've looked at, of the ones we've looked at, and we, and we try to look at each and every one because, as I'll show you, this has clinical significance, they all signal in a RAS-independent fashion as constitutive dimers. So there are multiple translocations in BRAF and CRAF, rare, but found in most tumors. 
Turns out that both uh, CRAF and BRAF in the amino terminus have a domain that's an anti-dimerization domain. It's been known for years through truncation experiments. You truncate RAF at this place, you relieve the anti-dimerization domain, and these now dimerize without RAS. And that, and, and that becomes a transforming constitutively active RAF. In each and every case that we've looked at, the translocation or the fusion protein results in either deletion of the amino terminus and the anti-dimerization domain, or a fusion that gets rid of the anti-dimerization domain and constitutively dimerizes. What about the point mutations? There are point mutations all over the place, including V600, which is the most active. If you use it in a model system where you can tune RAS, you can turn it on and off. In this case, again, a HER2 cell, where if we give a HER2 inhibitor, we turn off RAS. When you do that, you turn off ERK signaling and you turn off in, uh, RAF kinase as measured in in vitro kinase activity. All the other mutants no longer require RAS. Okay, either kinase activity is intact and ERK is intact. So why is this? Well, they all dimerize, and their ability to transform and their ability to be, their activity is dependent on this constitutive dimerization. And we, I'm not going to show you the co-IP dimer assays. I will show you, this is the, uh, the crystal, this is the dimerization interaction domain. Arginine 509 is necessary for uh, dimerization. Arch 509H is a mutation that kills wild type C and BRAF. It also kills the translocations. This is a CRAF translocation. Dead when you put in, actually, the, uh, the CRAF homolog is 401 arginine. And if you put this in to a variety of mutants, and I'm just showing three here, you kill RAF activity. This is, uh, these are the mutants. This is with 509H. Activity is off. There is one exception. The one exception is important for teaching, for conceptual reasons, but also because it's the most common site of RAF mutation. They're V600 mutations, V600E and V600K. Uniquely in our experience, these function as monomers. So you find them as monomers. They, uh, they don't associate uh, with each other in cells. With, they can be dimerized, but when there's no RAS GTP in the cell, they're monomers. And when you put in 509H, you don't kill the activity uniquely. So what are the consequences of this? V600E functions as a monomer. It has enormous output, higher ERK output than anything we've seen in tumors or normal physiology. That causes an enormous level of ERK phosphorylation feedback and expression of families of dusts and sprouties. That turns off, well, it, it severely limits signaling. So many of what, I mean, this has great resonance for me. Well, Bob Weinberg's talk had great resonance for me with many of the autocrine and paracrine growth factors. Their ability to sig signal is severely limited in these tumors because of the level of ERK feedback. And I will show you something about that in a minute. So I'm going to argue this creates a paradigm relevant not only to mechanism of transformation, but to drug sensitivity, to acquired resistance, and adaptive resistance. And it suggests how to think about combinations. Is there a timer somewhere that I can? Uh, if I could see, I could. How much time do I have? OK. All right, so I probably shouldn't show this, but I can't resist showing tumors going away. So everybody has, so I'm going to talk about RAF inhibitors. Just why do RAF inhibitors work? So you've seen lots of pictures of them working in melanoma and pictures of them not working in other diseases. This is just an MRI that even I can read. Uh, this is a lung cancer, a BRAF V600E lung cancer, which responds with a slightly lower frequency than melanoma. Uh, as I said, even I can read this. This is six weeks after therapy. Why does this occur? It occurs for the following reason, in my opinion. When you give a RAF inhibitor, to a tumor with V600E BRAF, or V600K, you do what you'd expect a RAF inhibitor to do. 
You turn off PMAC, you turn off PIRC, you turn off signaling, very nice. When you give it to any other tumor or normal cell, as a function of the level of activated RAS, you activate ERC signaling. So this shocked me. I then read an article by Dr. Cohen, who actually noticed this long before I did, so he called it a RAF activator, which in fact was completely and more accurate than calling it a RAF inhibitor. But since it's an ATP, since it does compete with binding for ATP to the enzyme, that's the sense in which we call it a RAF inhibitor. So why does this happen? Well, here's a model we published in 2010 in Nature, and I obviously have no time to, to prove this to you, so you just have to accept the PowerPoint and can talk about it later. The way the drug works is as follows. RAS activates RAF dimerization. The drug binds to one protomer in the dimer and allosterically activates the unbound protomer. The reason you get activation, that's only part of it, is the allosteric activation is associated with negative cooperativity of binding to the second site, as it often is with allosteric activation. So the majority of dimers are in the half-bound active and activated state. The reason these drugs work is that the V600E are monomers. The reason they are monomers is they have high output, the RAS GTP is off, and they function as monomers, okay? So that's why the drug works. Now, as a little bit of proof text or consist, data consistent with the model, when you give RAF inhibitors in just about every case, you activate at low concentrations, and at much higher concentrations you inhibit, which you expect from the model, and the difference between the amount required to activate and inhibit is the is a poor in vitro measure of the degree of, in vitro, of negative cooperativity. If you now look at melanomas, and this is sort of interesting, and these aren't melanomas, you have three major genetic lesions in melanoma, in sporadic melanoma. RAS mutation, NF1 mutation, and uh, NF1 loss of function, and RAF mutation. RAS GTP is high in the RAS, and RAS is shown here and not shown uh, in the NF1s, but that is the case, and uh, we and others have shown that. In the V600E, the RAS GTP is off. So if it were easier to genotype, if it were easier to do RAS GTPs in tissue than genotype, which is not the case, but I could tell you which of the V600E melanomas by just looking at the, uh, at the RAS GTP. And now I'll go back to the same plot I showed you before, and this is, again, consistent with the idea. The, RAS, the RAF mutants that are constitutive dimers are universally, in this case, universal is three, but we've probably tested about 30 of these now, they're universally insensitive because they are constitutive dimers. The ones, and we know that, and I'll show you why, but only the V600Es and Ks are sensitive. And this is why we put all of the mutants we hear about from our clinician friends through this assay, because it doesn't, since we don't know the structural basis for the constitutive dimerization, we don't know that the next mutant you find in someone's brain tumor or ovarian cancer that's new won't also function as a monomer, so that's why we do it. So this model suggests mechanisms of acquired resistance. It suggests that anything, that any lesion that causes dimerization will cause resistance. And that's exactly the case. There are four clinically validated mechanisms of resistance right now. MEK mutations, which are very rare, and the other three are NRAS mutations, which cause dimerization, BRAF amplification, which we have shown experimentally, works via dimerization. V600E 509H overexpression will not cause resistance, but V600E overexpression will. And finally, found by David Solid, and we collaborated with David Solid to find a an aberrant splice of BRAF that causes resistance. It causes resistance because you again delete the anti-dimerization domain, you get constitutive dimerization, you're now resistant. If you make the 509H of this truncated RAF, you are sensitive. Uh, and this is just what you can do with a V600 truncation. The other truncations lose activity if you put in the 509H mutation. The splice, because it's V600E, maintains activity. 
So you can look at the amount of RAF inhibitor required to inhibit the dimer and the amount inhibited to in, uh, required to inhibit the dimer. I take this as an operational measure of the amount required to inhibit the, the first site, this as the amount required to inhibit the second site, since you have to inhibit both to inhibit ERK signaling there. And in fact, if you look at docs on V600, in a, in, a, in a V600 melanoma, which is sensitive, if you increase expression or increase NRAS, you create resistance. Uh, so ERK-dependent dermis can be divided into two classes, which this is a ridiculous Neil Rosen formulation of interest for me for the way I'm talking about this, driven by RAF monomers, which is only one case, V600 mutants in tumors with low RAS GTP. It's an important case for two reasons. It's common, and it's the only case in which RAF inhibitors currently available will work. On the other hand, driven by dimers is everything else. RAS, NF1, uh, non-V600 RAF mutants, and V600E that are resistant to drugs. For these, we need dimer inhibitors. We're trying to get dimer inhibitors. There are a lot of fancy ways you can do it. We did it in a non-fancy way. Uh, we got RAF inhibitors from every source we could steal from or get it from, from libraries of RAF inhibitors. Almost all of them showed lots of negative cooperativity, except two. This is one from a company in Beijing called Beijing. And you see that you inhibit, uh, you inhibit the V600 dimer as well as you inhibit the V600 monomer. You require a little more. You reverse resistance in, with this drug, and now the resistance and the uh, V600 are similarly sensitive. I will tell you these work in NRAS tumors. They do not work in KRAS tumors. This opens up the possibility of finding drugs that will selectively inhibit other dimers like CRAF dimers and pancreas cells. Do I have two more minutes? Okay. Finally, adaptive resistance. Let's go back to V600 tumors. V6, as I said, Bob talked about all the ligands around, and I totally agree with him. This is, these ligands are determinative of the network and of cell-cell interaction. I'm arguing that in the V600 cells, the ligands don't work very well. When you inhibit ERK, however, if this, if this model is, has any uh, veracity, uh, you inhibit ERK, you will relieve the feedback, 24 hours or 12 hours or some hours after inhibiting the pathway, now the ligands will work. And this turns out to be the case. So this is an artificial experiment where we give, an ERK in, where we give a RAF inhibitor to tumors for 24 hours. And as every, at various time points, we stimulate these cells with EGF or norregulin or HGF or lots of other ligands for 10 minutes. You will see that 30 minutes after the drug, EGF and neuregulin do not activate RAF, do not activate AKT, do not activate MEK. At two hours, you start seeing some activation. At four to eight to 16 hours, you start seeing mammoth activation. This is because the feedback is decaying. The inhibition of ERK occurs in five minutes. The loss of dust shown here and sprouty not shown takes eight to 16 hours, and I'm sure there are many other variables that we've not identified yet, but basically you relieve the feedback, you activate signaling, and this is the mechanism whereby adding ligands creates resistance in some tumors. What are the consequences of this? You induce RAS GTP, as you'd expect. This is not with ligand now. This is just you give a RAF inhibitor, to a, cell, a melanoma cell with very low RAS CTP, you remove the feedback, RAS CTP goes up. It's still very low. This is quite overexposed gel. When one does that, one gets this minuscule activate rebound in ERK. The rebound in ERK occurs because the RAS CTP induces CRAF dimers. The CRAF dimers are insensitive to adding more RAF inhibitor. They are sensitive to MEK inhibitor. Now, if you just looked at time zero and time 24, which is most people's first time point, or many investigators, you see you're inhibiting the pathway quite a bit. 
But we've shown, and this is published in Cancer Cell last year, so I will not show most of the data, this little induction of PIRC in the setting of low DUSP gives you high output and attenuates the effect of the drug. Now, what we would argue is, uh, Bob Abraham showed this for the ALK inhibitor. You can show this for any targeted inhibitor, ALK, RAF, EGFR, you get this continuous function. We would argue this relief of feedback is part of what creates the difference between this kind of regression and this kind of regression. If you give MEK plus RAF, just give a little bit of MEK to inhibit that rebound, it works, very, it improves animals, as Bill just showed, and uh, GSK did a study of MEK plus RAF versus RAF, randomized phase two, where they almost doubled the time to progression. Okay, and this study was done wrong, not because they did anything wrong, but in the sense they weren't doing it for this reason, and it could have been done much better, in my opinion, in terms of schedule and dose, so we can talk about that later. Last thing, RAF inhibitors work great in melanoma. They don't work so great in RAF thyroid or RAF colon. So this is mostly the work, this is the work of Jim Fagan at Sloan Kettering, Jeff Engelman and Jim and I have all talked about this. The rebound is much greater in thyroid and in colon, and in, uh, in colon cancer. Jim thinks the dominant kinase in thyroid is HER3, or the dominant receptor. Jeff has shown the dominant kinase in, uh, in colon is EGFR. If you add, this is a liver metastasis, we and Novartis and others are now doing EGFR inhibitors plus RAF in colon. We're getting very, these are early studies, but many patients are responding like this. This is loss of the liver man. So last slide. Uh, the idea here, I don't like calling this rewiring because that suggests going from one thing that's fixed to another thing that's fixed. Call it what you will. There's an adaptation of the network to inhibiting any enzyme in the network. That adaptation may do nothing significant. Gleevec seems to work very well, even though Neil Shah has shown this kind of adaptation. Or it may make the drug not work, work less well or not at all or make the patient worse. The idea here is we think it's imperative that we find systems in which we can study this and define it, and we think it's an important paradigm for developing combination therapies. Many such therapies are being, uh, trials are being done now, some of which are working quite well. It's hard to know in, in clinical trials what the exact mechanism is. But we think one of the big problems here is we do not understand the animal models, as Bill suggests, Bill Sellers suggested, do not perfectly or even maybe imperfectly uh, model the human because the ligands are different. So in addition to looking at models, we are trying to start a program where we biopsy the tumor, determine the driver, give the drug, and we then, X hours later, and I do not know what X is, but hours later or a day later, re-biopsy. And biopsy as many times as you can so we can get some picture as a function of genotype what the feedback reactivation uh, is and then develop trials based on this. And the last thing I'll tell you is I say thanks for listening. This work was collaboration with a lot of people. The feedback RAF is all Zan Yao and Piro Lito. Uh, Pulikos Pulikakos figured out the RAF mechanism. This is all a long-term collaboration with David Solit, with Charles, with guys from Novartis, and with Beijing. Thank you very much. Well, I often describe, uh, the students here at MIT often describe learning at MIT as trying to drink from a fire hose. And I think that uh, we've admirably done that today as far as cell signaling uh, and its translation into, into uh, cancer therapies. Um, I'm not going to bore you with any closing remarks. There's nothing I could say that could top the fantastic things that we've heard today. I'm very grateful to all the speakers. I want to especially thank some of the staff that have been involved uh, in, in providing uh, the venue that you had in front of you, particularly Pam DeFreya, Cindy Quentz, Laurie Spindler, and Mike Moran. And I'd like everybody to give one more round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>